that needs to be addressed seriously by the East African community uh, leadership because it has happened over and over again. And most of the time, the Kenyan uh, fishermen are always arrested in Uganda. They are punished, like as it has been said. Some are kept in cells for so long, uh, and, and, and then it goes just like that. So, Mr. Speaker, we really need our government to take this matter very seriously because when they come to Kenya, the Ugandans, Kenyans do not hold them the way they are. So our apparatuses also need to be very seriously on the ground to protect the Kenyans, and not only about fishermen, about even all other traders across the borders between Kenya and Uganda. Mr. Speaker, I also would like to uh, probably support, uh, suggest that uh, the Committee on Regional Integration also... Hello? Mr. Speaker? No, he's not hearing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also would like to, uh, to suggest that the Committee on Regional Integration probably be involved uh, in this petition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, in this statement. This is, uh, Bondo, member for Bondo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a serious no menace. Mr. Speaker, the whole issue of the conflict between Kenya and Uganda, particularly our fishermen, is a menace. And... Uh, uh, the, 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 the time that this will be addressed, I think there's going to be a lot of peace in that region. If at all we are completely unable to determine our boundaries, let's use the simplest way, even if it's a string. Can we have it on the lake? For anybody else, if you are crossing from Ugandan side, you get to know you are at the boundary. Or if you are crossing from the Kenyan side, you get to know that you are at the boundary. Because it is difficult. Nobody can know exactly where that boundary is. And what we are conflicting on is fish. Even when you had a boundary over the water, fish will not have respect, will never respect that boundary. They will cross left and right. So the most important thing is that we must get a harmonious way of coexisting, particularly between Kenya, Kenyans, and the Ugandan side. But more so, the people who are using the resources on the lake, Mr. Speaker. It's something that has been there for long, it's been persistent, and we must get a solution to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a big problem for all people around the lake. But Mr. Speaker, I just want to draw attention that there was actually two years ago, we passed and established the Coast Guard as a unit which function was to actually guard the coast and actually protect the fishermen. And, and this, it was expected that by the time the Uganda forces come in, they would probably meet our coast guards and therefore resolve this issue without affecting the, the fishermen. So, Mr. Speaker, I think what we should look at, what does the coast guard do, particularly in Lake Victoria? It was actually expected that a base would be established somewhere around Busia. So, Mr. Speaker, this is something we really must address as a country. Yes, last three, because Mutunga, you want to speak to this? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the issue raised by Honorable Anjala, the member for Putalangi, is a very serious issue, and I think it needs uh, attention, because all of us, especially who live along the border, these resources must be shared equally and without discrimination. We are all signatories to the East African Federation. And as East Africans, we should not have police arresting the people of Putalangi, the people of Endebes, the people of uh, Funyula, or the people of Matayos. They should be freely moving, whether they are fishermen or they are hunters and gatherers, so that they get whatever resources they need to get. So I think this is something that should be addressed by the head of state of Kenya, President Ruto, together with his brother, President Museveni, so that this issue can be solved once and for all. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Let's end here on this. Mutunga, take a minute. You'll be the last. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, the issue of uh, uh, skirmishes in Lake Victoria, especially aggression by the Ugandan people, and especially by the Ugandan government officials, is quite disturbing. Honorable Speaker, 
we wonder why we do not hear of such instances by the Kenyan security forces. The last time we had issues with Migingo Highland, and there was so much of aggression from the Ugandan uh, government. On our speaker, this matter seems to be fizzling out. Whenever it comes up, we just discuss it here, and it doesn't take effect. We are asking the relevant institutions to take it up and deal with it to the conclusion, because, Honourable Speaker, we should not forget that the Second World War was caused by a single assassination in Europe. So Ugandans are, are, are going too far to, to, to cause a lot of aggression to the Kenyans. As we are resilient and we believe in neighborliness, we believe in friendship, when they had problems with Indamin and Bindada, they were living here, and we never killed them. We never disturbed them. The water has actually come from Kenya. So, Honourable Speaker, we don't understand why they should always be disturbing our people when they are even fishing on our side of the border. Honourable Speaker, this matter needs to be dealt with conclusively. I thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, Defence, Intelligence and Foreign Relations, Kandie, can you bring a response in two weeks? Uh, we, will, we will do that, uh, Honourable Speaker. Okay. Tongoyo, response to a statement by Wilberforce Oundo. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Honorable Speaker, the statement uh, by Honorable Owindo, MP for Funyala, and sec to Funyula, and uh, asked. Uh, and requested to be informed the criteria of distribution of government vehicles to the national government administration officers, and uh, also, like specifically, the question, the criteria for, and the status of distribution, the step that the government has taken to ensure that all national government vehicles, administrative officers, particularly those in Funula constituency, are facilitated with the vehicles, and when the ministry is supplying vehicles to the national government administration officers, especially in. Sumia sub county. I said as follows, Honorable Speaker. The ministry has a shortfall of 1,718 units of motor vehicles, where above what is allocated from the leasing program and budgetary allocation for the National Treasury for the purchase of motor vehicles. The ministry has embraced the leasing program as the best way to address the mobility challenges faced in the service delivery. In the year 2021, the ministry retained 200 units of Ford Ranger model motor vehicles after expiry of the leasing program based on the mechanical report from the field administration administrative officers. The units were distributed to all the departments and field administration units as follows. Deputy County Commissioners, 68 units. County Commissioners, pool for use by ACC in the county, 102, departments in the ministry, 30, a total of 200. The question on, on regards to question number two, the ministry has submitted request to the National Treasury for a, a location of motor vehicles units under the leasing program, and the ministry is yet to get the location of motor vehicles. Uh, that is, Mr. Speaker, in the just budget, concluded budget, which actually I had mentioned uh, last week. Uh, in regards to question number two, Honorable Speaker, Samia sub county was among 68 sub counties that retained Ford Ranger model unit whose lease had expired. The MV registration GK B3391H is the current vehicle in use by the Deputy County Commissioner. The pool vehicles at the County Commissioner, Buzia County, are GKB369J and GKB745H. The Ministry is awaiting the National Treasury to allocate funds for the leasing program. Once the motor vehicles are availed from the leasing program, the ministry will deploy them to the field administrative officers, of course, to include uh, in this said sub county. Priority will be given to the sub counties that do not have leased motor vehicles, Samia sub county, 
included. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, and I submit. Oundo, you satisfied? We got the next. Honorable Speaker, yes, I'd had a discussion with the chair before, and what he has indicated here is what he had told me. Of course, Honorable Speaker, I'm not satisfied for two reasons. Number one, the timelines are not given. As I stand here, Honorable Speaker, this, the vehicle he's talking about is actually grounded. GKB391H is actually grounded. And yet the county commissioner indicates that even the ones that he has indicated here are not in good working condition. So I want to ask him to continuously engage the ministry so that we expedite the process, they can follow up the money in the treasury, and as they make, as they proceed with the leasing, please do not forget the various police stations in Funula constituency that have got no vehicles at all. To an extent, Honorable Speaker, the police cannot mount any security operation. They have no vehicles. Sometimes they have to use bicycles or motorcycles to chase after criminals, which is now becoming a very dire situation, and I want to ask him to continuously press the, the ministry to make sure that we move with the speed, address these issues. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. Tongoyo, yes, uh, because on the same? Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, when you listen to Honorable Tongoyo, he is saying that county commissioners have been given 102 vehicles for use by ACCs. And uh, I don't know how that distribution is done because many of the ACCs, including ACCs in Endebes, in Jepchoina, and other places, they have no vehicle to use. And I don't think they are, they are able to even access those bull vehicles. Yes. Secondly, you have out of the vehicles that are bought, 68 are given to the DCCs. Then 30 are given for departmental heads. This means those vehicles are remaining in Nairobi within the departments, and yet we are starving those who are far away who could be able to utilize those vehicles. I think Honorable Tongoya will need to go back to discuss further and uh, give, give us even a breakdown on how the one or two vehicles to the county commissioners have been distributed. And if possible, get those 30 that have been given to departmental heads to be distributed to the various uh, counties so that ACCs, DCCs can be facilitated to be able to perform their duties. Honorable Speaker, I appreciate uh, the, the counter response from the members, but from actually the opening remarks, Honorable Speaker, I think I did make it clear that there is an acute shortage of the motor vehicles. And it's not, it is not just actually in the sub counties, uh, the sub county of the member, the concerned member, but to the majority of actually administrative units in the country. But the question, Honorable Speaker, lays in this house. It is a matter of resources and the issue of resources is done by this House. So I will challenge up, call upon all members. If we want to address the uh, acute shortage of the motor vehicles among administrative uh, units and officers, we allocate sufficient resources to the ministry so that they can able to list more. Go to the next. Is uh, Joseph Namar in the House? OK, go ahead and uh, respond to his statement. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, the statement regarding the incident involving uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service personnel in Massabit County by the Honorable Member uh, Turkana Central. Honorable Speaker, the Member of Parliament for Turkana Central, Honorable Joseph Namur, had requested a statement regarding an incident involving Kenya Wildlife Service personnel in Massabit County. The Honourable Member particularly requested to be informed detailed account of the incidents, including circumstances that led to the ex ex extensive force by the KWS, the specific action that has been initiated to ensure that investigation and to ensure that the Ministry has put in place to ensure that the family of one Mr. Esinyeni 
is compensated and the step being taken to de-escalate tension between the KWS and the local communities, including collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife to prevent such tragic instances. Honorable Speaker, on, I want to state as follows. On 12th June 2024, at around 1830, KWS officers based at Sibiloi Game Reserve were conducting a patrol along the shores of the Lake Turkana when they encountered an ambush and contact with armed illegal fishermen, whereby two KWS officers were virtually injured as follows. One, number 66099, Samuel Longalon, the assistant game warden, shot on the right part of the chest. Number 8249, CPL Michael Oreng, shot on the right part of the chest. The incident was reported to the North Horn Police Station. The bodies were later removed for the scene after processing by the OCS North Horn for KWS camp. Within the same game reserve, before being airlifted, the following day to Nairobi for preservation and postmortem, on the 13th, Honorable Speaker, the KWS officers mounted operation along the showers of the lake in pursuance of the criminal and flushing out illegal fishing camps within the protected area. Three days later, it was reported at Kalalok Police Station, Turkana Central Subcounty in Turkana County that Mr. Daniel Esinyen, a Turkana fisherman, was shot in the waters of Lake Turkana, allegedly by the KNWS officers in retaliation. The investigation into the vital killing of the two KNWS officers has been opened and the case is still pending <coughs> under investigation by the DCIO North Hall. Two persons were arrested but found not connected with the case and were charged for offense of illegal entry into a protected area. They pleaded guilty as charged and were sentenced to three years each by Massabit Law Court. In investigation into the alleged murder, of one Mr. Daniel Esinyen is also pending under investigation of DCIO, North Hall. Honorable Speaker, the case is still pending under investigation. Once investigations are concluded, the necessary action will be taken against whoever found culpable. On the last question, Mr. Speaker, the multi-agency patrols are being mounted along the neighboring villages like Muite, Kambi Turkana and Kokaili. Kokai. In addition, sensitization of the members of the public on the importance of keeping law and order, like avoiding fishing in protected area and coexistence within the law and forces is ongoing. The Coast Guard officers based at Lawarengag based are closely monitoring against illegal fishermen. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, signed by Kizuri Kindiki. Kizuri. Honorable Joseph, you satisfied? We got the next issue. Honorable Speaker, I am not satisfied by the response. Uh, Honorable Speaker, this is a very emotive issue and it must be understood by the CS whom I have a lot of respect the CS for interior and uh, this incident is still ongoing as we speak people are being killed some are even dropped into the lake and uh, they are fishing gear boats are getting confiscated. Honorable Speaker, these are two separate incidents. When the two officers were killed, they were killed by poachers. Because in Sibiloi, there is fish and there are also the wild animals. So the poachers are the ones who killed the two KWS officers. And we give our condolences. Number two, Honorable Speaker, the report, the report of helicopter 
registration number 5Y KWM is not being reported. And this is the helicopter that was used to kill Daniel Esekon inside the water. Honorable Speaker, as much as I agree that there is still a lot of investigation that needs to be done, there is need for a recommendation to have a manner in which the fishermen, the wild animals, can coexist with the community. Because, Honorable Speaker, there are two communities or tribes there. There is the Dasanach, the Merile sub-tribe of the Dasanach, and uh, the Turkana. They coexist. But in their coexistence with the KWS, there is no demarcation to understand the extent at which the park the lake in the lake extends to. That needs to be, to be understood. The same happens even in the central, central highland. Honorable Honorable Speaker. Namar, you are now making a speech. You are to seek clarification. Yes, Your Excellency, this is a very emotive issue that requires a lot of further investigation. It is not very light as it's being put yes, by the CS interior. And uh, we, have, we are continuing to lose boats. We are continuing to lose the fishing gear. We are continuing to lose engines. In fact, some have even been burnt into ashes. And people are killed and thrown into the water. This is inside Kenya. It is not the case of Uganda versus Kenya. This is Kenyans against Kenyans. And, you are, and, and Honorable Speaker, we need further classification on the same. That is why I'm saying the response given is not enough. Thank you. Your response is alleged the not to be enough? The issue of the helicopter, uh, Honorable Speaker, the guardship of the helicopter, I think is an allegation. Uh, it's not something that uh, the, the member can really prove. But having said this, Honorable Speaker, I understand the magnitude and the seriousness of the issue. Maybe taking into account that now we have the CSS, maybe if the member needs more clarification, maybe we, I, I don't know, maybe your guidance, we can have it as a question time so that we can able to address it more further. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I wanted to add on what my colleague from Turkana Central has uh, put across. Mr. Speaker, this issue of KWS and uh, fishermen like Turkana is uh, getting to a different level. Uh, the incident that happened, it is true, Mr. Speaker, sir, a number of fishermen from the Turkana side were killed by the helicopter, not even by, by, by the KWS. And we want to know, which helicopter was that? Was it a, a government helicopter or, the, or a private helicopter? Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, uh, up to two weeks ago, we've still been getting uh, dead bodies on the shores of Lake Turkana in Nachukui. A number of them were were, were, were picked up by the, by, by the community along Lake Turkana shores. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, the response that has been given is not satisfactory to us because this issue as, as um, the community in Turkana at some point might, might have to, I mean, if it is not put, uh, it's, if not handled well, they might have to, uh, you know, even fight the KWS, because um, it is even said, Mr. Speaker, the people who killed officers and which we sympathize with the family, those who are Dasanaj from Ethiopia, not the Turkanas, but when, the, when KWS was responding, it responded to fishermen who are not even around the highland. So there is a problem, and we need to sit with the DG, the Director General of KWS, so that this thing is sorted out. Because the killing is continuing. Our people are not even fishing. And that is their mainstay. So what is supposed to happen, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. 
Honorable Tongo, I suggest or direct that you have a meeting with the two members of parliament and indeed members from Turkana County so that you can further discuss this. Next order. Yeah, yes, Naisula. Hold on. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on 24th of last month, I did request a statement regarding challenges facing the new higher education funding model, and you did direct the chairperson of the Committee of Education to respond in two weeks, Mr. Speaker, and uh, two weeks ended last week. And this is a very important statement. As we know, many students will be reporting to uh, higher education institutions next month, and guardians and parents are, um, have anxiety over the new higher education funding model. Where is the Chair for Education, Honorable Meli? Vice Chair Malulu Njendi. Professor, you are a member? Yes. Yes, Honorable Speaker. You have the statement? I can attempt to give No, I don't want an attempt. <laughs> Either you have the statement yeah, or you don't. I have, I have the statement. Are you able to respond now? Yes, I can. I can. Go ahead. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I am here to stand in for the chair to present the, to give a response to the statement by Honorable Naisula on the funding model. The, uni the, new, the university new funding model, uh, Chair, on, uh, 30, on May 3rd... Which Chair? You are addressing the Speaker. Sorry, <laughs> Honorable Speaker, yes. on 3rd May 2023, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya announced the introduction of a new funding model in higher education effective from the financial year 2023-2024. It is, it is a student-centered funding model and uh, it represents a shift from the previous uh, model, uh, model of the higher education, uh, education funding board. Uh, this model, honorable speaker, uh, aims to ensure e equitable access to higher education by directly supporting students based on their financial needs rather than allocating funds to institutional to institutions sorry the shift honorable speaker from the previous funding uh, is to move individual individualized and needs based funding mechanism i mean funding to students and it has uh, three key elements. One is it has a mean testing instrument. It, is, it, it gives direct support to students and it's, it has special consideration to vulnerable groups. And this model, Honorable Speaker, is banded in three, in five, uh, or it has five levels, so it's uh, it's banded in five. Uh, it is. Uh, it has five levels. One is the. It, level one includes the estimated household income of below five thousand nine hundred and ninety-five per month. The second level is the is a group of persons whose income is five thousand to 23,670 per month. The third level is uh, the group which, is, uh, which estimated household income is between 23,671 to 70,000 per month. And level four, is, the level four group represents estimated household income between 70,000 to 119,000 per month. Level five, this group represents estimated household income above 120,000 per month. So each student is supposed to benefit from this university funding model based on these five levels. Uh, band one, 
as a, I, I want to give an example of band one. If a student is supposed to be banded as band one, this student will get a scholarship, a loan, a percentage of scholarship, a percentage of loan, and a percentage of household. Level one, or referred to as band one, this is a group, these this are students drawn from extremely needy and vulnerable, vulnerable backgrounds in the society. Their survival is heavily dependent on government interventions. These include needy orphans, applicants sponsored in the Ministry of Education Elimu Fund, applicants in social protection, safety nets, and applicants with disabilities who are included under affirmative action. Students classified in this band should be coming from households earning below 5,995. And these students will get 70% scholarship, they will get 25% loan, and they will get 5% household. Those students who are in level two... Order. Order, member for Kitui. Sorry. Order. Order, Robert Mbui. Is that Robert Mbui? Yes, you are now constituting a Kamukunji disrupting the proceedings. Of Go on, uh, Professor. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, band two are those students who are in level two. These are the, the socioeconomic gap between band one and two is so blurred that it is no clear distinction. That is, but those students who are in band one and band two, the, the difference is very marginal. However, compared to the band one, band two have some income, but cannot sustain their basic needs, like clothing, food, and shelter. This band two cannot survive without government support. Ideally, they deserve an equivalent government intervention, like band one, but which var var variable loans but with variable loans and scholarship. This group includes estimated household income between 5,000 to 23,670 per month. So this category of students will get a scholarship of 60%, they'll get a loan of 30%, and they will have household of 10%. The third band Honorable Speaker, which is categorized as level three. How much more to go? We, we are in band three. We have two more. This category. Can try to paraphrase the professor. Yes. Yes, uh, Naisula. Mr. Speaker, I was actually going to rise on a point of order that question two and three, since I have the statement, it's quite a, a lengthy uh, response, and these are things that I can read and keep the ministry to account. The important parts would be the, three, the five bands, and she's in band two, but also question three on the breakdown of the university fees, and the last question on how the needy students will not be left out. She can leave out question, um, question two, question two, two which is quite lengthy and goes straight to question three and four because it's um, yes. to, that one she'll be addressing to the public as well uh, professor can you because uh, it's a long long winding statement can you go to the last part that the member would want probably to question you i stand guided honorable speaker so i was in band three which is level three band three is uh, a composition uh, of needy people. She said, leave those bands and go to part, so you said part three. She said, yes. 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 Uh, give to Mutunga. Yes. Honor Speaker, that information is extremely important for us. Okay, fine, go on. Because we need to understand it as much as Kenyans need to understand it. Go and also on, the, our, the students. So please let us just read the, the five bands. Yes. Uh, 
Honorable Speaker, Ban 3, which Hold is... Hold on, uh, Professor, yes. Because... Honorable Speaker, we would also want the Professor to simplify it. So that uh, if we are to communicate to even members of public, when you are telling somebody they are band one, band two, band three, you know, even members of public are following these uh, proceedings. Mm. Can she make it more simpler that it is able to communicate to the parent who has even not gone to school? Professor? Yeah. Honorable Speaker, in response to the statement which has been made by Honorable Mutunga and Band okay, three. let me continue. This particular band, that band one to five, is the differentiation or the different categories or categorizations of students in the colleges and universities. And the category which belong, which a student belongs, will dictate how much school fees uh, they are going to pay, how much um, household they are going to get, and how much loans they are going to get from government. So at this level, I was in the student category who is considered as band three or level three. And in this category, uh, these are, uh, this is a category of people considered as needy with some modest income. That is a parent who is needy but has some income. And these are, these are, the, these are low cadre workers that also need significant government support to allow them to allow their students to continue. This is a group of people who get a salary or who get income between 23,671 to 70,000 per month. That is a parent whose income is between this, uh, between 23 to 70, is considered band three. A band four parent or is at level four, yeah? band three details. The scholarship they'll get is 50%, and then they'll get a loan of 30%. Professor, there's a point of order. Yes, because next. You, 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 know, you know, Honorable Speaker, <coughs> Professor had already given us those bands that band one is this much to that much. Now, what we want to understand, how much does the student qualify to get? Yeah? Because you had already said in the first category, they are getting 75%, then 15%, then 5%. But how much is that? Yeah? Can you break it down in a more simplified way? That the amount of money is this, and they are qualified to get this. Then the second category will get this amount of money. The third category will get this amount of money. And the four, fifth category will get this amount of money. So that people know how much they can be able to raise and how much the government can be able to give. Uh, through the speaker, this, I was, when I am done with the different bands, I'll give an example of each, uh, an example of how much a student is going to get in each band. One, one, okay, I can give only one. This is because I must give, um, let me, allow me to finish the characteristics of every band, and then I'll now give an example of how much, for instance, if we pick a student who is going to take medicine in a university, how much are they going to get? No, and I still believe okay. what you have Thank said. Thank you. Have been said in <laughs> level, band four, level three, these are middle income earners under differentiated unit cost. This applicant could survive without funding, but the actual program cost created a justification for government funding. This group represents estimated household income for between 70,000 to 119,000 per month. So in that case, these are a group of parents who are maybe comfortable, they have an income, but the problem is the, 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 the program the student is going to take in the, at the university. Because a student who is going to take BA is different from that student who is going to take medicine. So they'll get 40% scholarship, 30% loan, and 30% household. And then finally, we have the level band five, which is level five. Band five are high income earners with an estimated income of 120 and above. 
and might, be, might need some modest government support as well, depending on the family size, the number of children in school, and tertiary level. And they, are, they might need support simply because they have a heavy burden. And um, these are people within the bracket of, or people who earn more than 600,000 and they can do without any government support. In this case, if they apply, they get 30% scholarship, 30% loan, and 40% household. And uh, I don't need to answer question two. I move to the, to the, I don't also need to talk about the, the, the ways the, uh, the ministry is communicating to the various stakeholders. They have multiple ways. That one can be, uh, that one is already in the public domain. So I want to give a clear breakdown of just one case of a student. The point of order from uh, Honorable Nyamai. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Um, listening to Professor, and I, she's, doing, she's trying to do the best that she can to communicate uh, this information from the chair or to respond to the matter that was raised by, Prof, by the Honorable Naisula. But uh, it's important for, for us to fully understand as people's representatives, and I'm sure that uh, the students are also listening and parents, it seems not to be very clear on these indicators that we are going to use. Mr. Speaker, is it possible for Professor to explain clearly this 30% or these other percentages, those who are not going to get because of uh, the fact that they have other means because it's not clear, Mr. Speaker. As, a, as the MP for Kitui South, I still do not understand what I will tell the students in my constituency, what indicators are being used to identify those who get 30%. Is it a study that is going to be done so that it is done in advance, that we know who gets what percentage, so that students do not get stranded? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to comment. Yes, Dr. Mutunga. Hold on, Professor. Uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, the students are picked by COOPS, and then they are also given a form alongside for scholarship. This is the form that they fill all the details about their family backgrounds, especially the, the socioeconomic background of the family. Based on what they are filled with the form, That criteria, the criteria the professor is discussing, is used to assess into which bird they will be placed. When you are, when you are given 70% scholarship, it means if the fee is 150,000 a year, then you pay 30% of that fee. And then you also qualify for 20% as loan now. 30% is scholarship, and then 20% you are given as loan, which you can pay after you are employed, and then 10% is also given for the household, for the upkeep of the, of the students. That's how this, this is interpreted. And the students need to know that. What is important is for them to fill the forms comprehensively and give the correct information so that they can be considered fairly. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, uh, thank you very much. This is a very, very, very uh, important discussion we are having because a lot of students have actually despaired. They are not even going to fill these forms, they are not working on it because the initial forms that they received scared them off university places. I know there was a circular by the, uh, uh, the secretary, you know, the principal secretary, that they withdrew those forms. But you see, honorable speaker, those forms have not been withdrawn. And parents are really struggling to try to raise. I know parents in my constituents who are selling land and all that because this information has not been unpackaged to them. I have had an opportunity to organize for a fora where I brought all students and I brought help and I brought groups to talk to them. But you see, I couldn't reach to everybody. And yet, the deadline, the deadline is on the 15th, which is, I think, Thursday, for filling those forms. And I would like to request the Minister of Education to extend this deadline, this deadline so that we have more students 
apply. Actually, there are more students who have not applied than those who have applied because the information is not getting to the student. So, Honorable Speaker, probably you need to give a direction to the new cabinet secretary that has taken office to fast track this issue. One, to extend the deadline, and two, to ensure that officers from help officers from coops go up to the sub-county levels get the students and the parents to be educated and they assisted in filling the forms so that we do not have any student disenfranchised because he didn't or did not get information honorable speaker this is important and i think your direction why is don't needed. we let uh, i thank you honorable speaker all these are very valid points hold on nice Professor, how much time do you require to finish reading the just, statement? Uh, Honorable Speaker, just five minutes. Pardon? Five minutes. Five minutes. Let's let her finish, then you can... Uh... Uh, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Mutunga has aptly put it that the data generated in this, uh, for these percentages emanates from the student himself or herself. And, and, and more so, the ministry already has a lot of data from students because when they are joining uh, secondary schools, they have their birth certificates, they have the details of their parents, and even from the NHIF card, which was still underused the other time, there is a lot of data. The ministry cannot, can access a lot of data in order to determine exactly how much an individual or a student can get. However, in situations where a student's data is not ably captured, they can always appeal. They also have appellate processes in, this, uh, in, in, the, in case you don't get the money. Mr. Speaker, I just want to give an example of uh, a student who is categorized as Banduan. That is that one who is very vulnerable and requires government support as, at all costs. I will give a case of a student who, is going to, who has been selected to take medicine and that one who has been selected to take Bachelor of Arts. And Mr. Speaker, there was a, a problem initially where the ministry was giving student letters with, which, with, which indicated a lot of money. Like a program for medicine, a student was getting a fee structure of 612000 And it was not necessary for the ministry to give unnecessary information because I can, I am, I'm sure most of the members here who went to the university in the 80s and 70s, they were only, the, the letters they used to get from the university only indicated the amount the household is supposed to pay. They were not given information on what the government was to pay, which I think the ministry erred on that. On that. They should only give the student, the fee structure should only indicate the household uh, support the student is supposed to be paying to the university. So one is a case of a student taking medicine. The program costs 612,000, Mr. Speaker. In this case, the student gets 70% scholarship, uh, 20 and 25, uh, that is 25% tuition, Sorry, the, the student gets 70% scholarship, tuition 25%, and in this case it translates to the 5% the household the student is going to take home is 30,000. Sorry, the student is going to receive from the government as household, that is the money for upkeep, will be 30,000. 30,600. But a student who is going to do Bachelor of, of Arts, let's take for B, B, BA. This student, the fee structure is supposed to indicate 122,400. This student is supposed to pay 85,000, is supposed to get 85,680 scholarship. It's supposed to pay, to, to get 30,600 loan. It's supposed to get upkeep 60,000 and is supposed to pay only 6,100. So every student, depending on the program you are going to take at the university, you will get uh, your fee structure depending on the course 
and your funding will depend on how, which information you fill in the form. So it's not a uniform amount. Every student will get information depending on the data which you have given. And uh, the, last, the last question, not the last, the one which uh, Honorable Monaisola said I should maybe give was the issue of the letters, the, 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 the fee structure on the admission letters. I think uh, as a committee, we had communicated that to the ministry and uh, we had given uh, them instructions that they withdraw the letters, the letters which they had been given prior and issue them with new letters with, uh, with uh, indicating the fee structure which, is, which the student is supposed to be paying, not the entire amount where the government is supposed to be supporting the student. And Mr. Speaker, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think Kenyans are in a position to still understand uh, what is really going on with this higher education model. Having looked at the, at the response, it's a good one, if it works or if it is implemented correctly. It happens also with anything new that is being introduced. But we have to be careful. And I want to ask my questions as such because we can't joke with the education of our children. Many children will not report to school, to TVETs, universities, and colleges if this information is not clear. So my first question is this. It is clear that this is a, a, a generated information. You key in and it comes out. I'm asking, has the ministry tested that, has it been fed? And what has come out of it? Has it been piloted? Yeah, in so many words. Has it been, I was trying to get the word. I wanted to ask, has this uh, been piloted? And what has been the response so far from the, from the pilot? The second thing is this. How will a child in the remote areas of Nyiro, in Samburu, Uko, remote, ensure that they apply and they get the information that they need using the online process. Lastly, the issue of the loan. What are the terms? Is it the normal help or are there new terms with the loan? Because, you know, the government is giving a lot of money, including the upkeep and all that. So is that really, is it a loan and what are the terms of it? And are children in private universities benefiting? Not the coops taken children, but if I want to take my child to, to a private university, do I benefit, do I benefit um, from this? So I think if first you could answer those questions and then um, we'll, we'll see. And lastly, we don't want confusion. The deadline, as Honorable Mbaya has said, is on 15th. It's being closed. So have all our children applied sufficiently to ensure that they get uh, the information. I've also seen that you've said children without national identity cards, they can use, you've said uh, students without national IDs, provisional application processes allow them to apply using alternative identification such as KCSE index number. That is a very important information because there are students who don't have IDs and they're wondering how they're going to apply for this. Professor, you can take a few, then you respond. Nikal. Mr. Speaker, a beautiful proposal that is not going on well because of just logistics and management. At this point, Mr. Speaker, what we need for every student is you are in band one, you are going to pay this much. Loan this much, loan this much. And household this. You are in band two, you are going to pay this much. And this, then, because right now, Mr. Speaker, I spend the whole of Sunday explaining to parents. They don't know the letter they have is the letter that went earlier, which just says what the cost of the, of the cost is. So now then the letter says, but if you want government help, apply through this. So that, all these details at this point, if the deadline is as it is, give parents a simple thing. Band A, band one, 
you pay this much, loan this, this, this. That's what they want. The details, then we will go into further communication. Number two, say extend the time because there's no time to do it for application. So there are things you do to get things going while you are going into the simple, the, the details that will work later on. Parents are going all over the place raising, trying to raise 500,000 shillings for medicine. Yeah. Information, simple, this is what to do, and this is how, and then you can, that can be one advert on a page. Band one this, band one this, the percentage is this. Then you put that system where they can put in even with a, 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 a mulika mwizi. And if you put your, in, your number, whatever number, then it tells you the band. Okay. So you know the band, you know what you're we supposed the to points. pay, then the rest we work out, Mr. Speaker. It's a crisis. Can uh, I? Uh, Justice. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity you've given me. I have tried to listen to Professor, uh, Mr. Speaker, even with my understanding of models, with my understanding of loan arrangements, with my understanding of bursary, I am more confused. And it calls, Mr. Speaker, when you finally give the direction, it calls for more communication to reach the people, to reach the students of this country. And we will not limit it, Mr. Speaker, to the newspapers alone. There are communication channels on the part of the government that should be used so that all the students who want to go to various courses can then get the information, Mr. Speaker. And I want in that kind of communication, for example, a student going to study Bachelor of Arts, a student going to study technology, a student going to study medical, this is the fee structure. And then this is the loan that will be given to the student. This is the buzzer that will be given to the student, and this is the balance. Such communication, Mr. Speaker, will really help us be able to reach our people and explain this model, which is so beautiful that my colleagues are saying, but then it is clouded in, a, in, 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 a, in a, some form of miscommunication and technicalities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. In uh, your own area of a lot of mastery, a book is Enemy of the People. A brilliant man by the name Dr. Stockman has a good idea, but the local man does not know. He loses it and he loses it all. What we are dealing with is a situation where the ministry has info, seems to have a procedure but the people don't know. Therefore, I'll be asking you, Honorable Speaker, I rushed in specifically for this. You can save this country and the students and the education of the new students who are going to the university by possibly helping the House resolve and make a ruling to the extent that the deadline be extended. Because that will really help as the new minister, whom we can now invite, comes down to write a proper memo that will indicate how the fee structures are. I don't want to repeat what the other members have said because what came out has already discouraged some learners from going to the university. Number two, if the house, if you could make a ruling that again these students who are supposed to go to university, all of them go. Because last time when you were in such a situation, that was the resolve that was done and it saved the situation. And then the rest of those issues will be done when they're already there. So that the ministry can have time to actually explain all these processes. When explained here, looks very good. But outside there, it's not communicated and it's not working. Parliament would have helped the entire education system for now. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable can you take your seat? This is your baby. And your member has tried her best. From what she has given to the House, even under an above average member is not following clearly. 
And this requires some different approach. Honorable Meli, I'll give you time to tomorrow to come and inform the House at 2.30. One, whether there is a possibility of extending time beyond 15th, which is day after tomorrow. Two, whether you can employ a better mechanism of communicating with the students, including but not limited to having education officers that are deployed up to division levels to be the centers of communication and filling of the forms by the students with guidance from those officers. Number three, you can also find out from the ministry if they can delegate the universities of admission as agents for assisting the students when they go to the university to fill the forms so that no student loses out because of either inadequate communication, poor communication, or miscommunication. Because from what Professor Barto has read to the House, the statement is begging more questions than giving answers. And as the chair of the committee, I would uh, advise you and direct you, get to the ministry this afternoon, and I'll give you an opportunity tomorrow at 2.30 to make a proper communication. I'm sure our concerns are the same. Let uh, the chairman go and get information and come and give to the House. Because listening to Naisula, the questioner, to Dr. Nikal, to Justice Kemei, to Mboko Milemba, to Mutunga, to Nyamai, to Owen, the concern is simple. A good idea, inadequate communication, a good idea, poor communication, a good idea, there is no clear implementation process. That is how I am understanding this issue. So if we agree to that, let's not belabor the point. Let the chairman and those with issues, I'll give you time tomorrow, because we're already getting to five. Yes. Yes, uh, Kamket. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, indulge me, Mr. Speaker. As the chairman comes to respond to those matters tomorrow, la two weeks ago, I saw a statement that was directed to TSC. And the, the committee has not responded to it, and I'm, I'm concerned, Mr. Speaker, that we are going on this. I'm not getting a, re a reply from... He is here. He has heard you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Address that. Members, I want us to... <laughs> Yes, Mutunga. On the same issue. My no, speaker, direction is, is an issue. There is an issue that the chairman should clarify to Kenyans. Is this going to be for the first year's university students and colleges this year, or is it going to be for all, all, all students in school? Yeah, that is a legitimate concern. Yeah. Are you Minister, dealing with new entrants then, then finally, or all students? Honorable okay. Speaker, whether the ministry can actually put put a pullout in the newspapers explaining this to the simplest level. And also, give those indicators. The indicators must be known. So, There must be various ways of communication. You do a pullout in the nation. How many children in Kibish get the nation? How many children in some place in Baragoi get the nation? Yes. Yes, uh, Naisula? I didn't want to speak after your ruling, but tomorrow and Thursday I will be, I have some work at the constituency, Mr. Speaker, and I'll allow the chairman to continue and the members, I'll get the response. But I wanted to ask just one question, which you have to ask the ministry. Normally when the students re report to school, they are told you have to pay a certain percentage for you to be admitted, all right? So, that student, since the government is taking, for example, 70% in terms of loan and scholarship, and the parent maybe is paying 20 30, or 30,000, and the student shows up and says that percentage is going to be paid by the, by the fund, will that student be admitted? And even in future, when the exchequer's delay, 
so that the fund is not payable to the school? Will that student continue with their education? And finally, the same question on whether this is for all students or the new starting this financial year. Odanga, I want to close here. I'm sure my direction has covered all your concerns. What is the issue? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The issue is, uh, I would like also to know, because usually the uh, Higher Education Loans Board has loans, uh, there is that uh, scholarship, and also there have been uh, bursaries. Uh, the issue of a bursary has not been addressed. Whether it is still there or it's not there, nobody has talked about it. I really want us to know. And Mr. Speaker, I think going forward, I would like to suggest that we'll have to change our standing orders. The issue of members of parliament responding to, our, to ourselves, I think, should not arise. We already because when we ask, the order. When we ask uh, uh, supplement... We already changed the standing orders. You can get, The minister will come here and answer questions. It is not the old system. Uh, I thought I had Professor Barto say money disbursed will be part bursary or scholarship and part loan uh, for the students depending on the categories. If you want to know how difficult it is to understand this, I understood Professor differently from what Dr. Nikal said. From what she said, I got the impression that a medical student paying 600 will get 75 bursary, 20 loan, and then you are left with 10%, is it? We are left with about 5% that you will pay. So clear all these things uh, mainly tomorrow. I'll give you adequate time as your colleagues go on recess, including yourself. You must have clarity of mind to communicate with Kenyans on what needs to be done. Is that all right? Okay, so those of you with concerns be here tomorrow 2.30 so that we can deal with that. Honorable members, I also promised you that those who are interested in uh, celebrating our gallant athletes who have brought uh, fame and glory to the country, I'll give you 30 minutes from now so that you can be able to speak to this. I'll start with... Uh, uh, KJ, and uh, because I'm sure many of you will want to speak, KJ, I'm told you have no athlete, leave those with athletes, <laughs> but I've given you space, two minutes each. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the pole position, and I start first by congratulating the Kenya team. I know there has been a lot of things said about this team, especially about their performance this year. But I'd like to remind this house that they come back home as the number one country, sporting country in Africa. And in the world, we are number two in athletics. So, Mr. Speaker, the Kenya team has done very well. But for those of us who are bashing this team, we've got to remind ourselves that when you're sending a child to an examination, you make sure that they leave the house, a house that is in order. The situation that was in this country before the team left is akin to sending a child to sit an examination when they're coming from an abusive house. Mr. Speaker, our national psyche, our national conversation, our national um, narrative is at its worst, Mr. Speaker. So we would not have expected this team to perform at its best. Mr. Speaker, the team that represented us in Paris had great faith uh, Kipiegon has done what no athlete has ever done in history. She ought to be celebrated. But even as we are celebrating the medal, the medal holders, we've got to remember a man by the name Kipchoge. He has done so well in his career. This one race that he did not finish cannot define his career. And finally, Mr. Speaker, soon after the Olympics, there is normally the Special Olympics, and Mr. Speaker, we want to ask each and every person who profiled the Olympics to profile the Special Olympics in equal measure. That includes the national broadcaster. If KBC could sponsor, could, could air live the Olympics, then KBC ought 
to give equal coverage to the Special Olympics. Those two are Kenyans, those two are athletes, and those two are flying the national flag. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for this opportunity. Member the back, uh, who, that's member four. Member for Kiambu, yes, uh, Mashua. Next to you. The mic next to you. Two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on the behalf of the uh, people of Kiambu, I would like to congratulate the Kenyan Olympic team. They did very well and made us all proud. And I, uh, <clears throat> I can remember how people were cheering and uh, watching on TV. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a concern about uh, uh, the athletes who have left Kenya because of greener pastures elsewhere. Today, in today's paper, we read about how uh, <clears throat> the people who are leading the delegation, maybe not this year, but prior years, had taken advantage of the athletes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you remember the lady who won the 3,000 steeplechase? called Wilfred Yavi, said that she was asked for a bribe of 200,000 so that she can represent Kenya. I think this is a great concern and this should be arrested so that uh, our athletes <clears throat> are not able to uh, offer bribes so that they can represent our country. The other issue, Mr. Speaker, is that we should ask ourselves why are so many athletes leaving Kenya uh, and representing other countries like Bahrain, uh, even the United States. And this is because, Mr. Speaker, is because in those countries, these athletes are better uh, looked after, they are honored, and they are respected. So, Mr. Speaker, our government should, the government should take care and make sure that our athletes are looked after properly. Mr. Speaker, it's very sad to note that uh, athletes who have represented Kenya in the past are now um, living in abject poverty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I just want to congratulate our athletes for the exemplary performance they have done in just concluded uh, Olympics. And notably, Mr. Speaker, Faith Kipiegon, who actually broke the Olympic record and at the same time did what no human being actually has ever done, men and women. Congratulations to that wonderful lady, Mr. Speaker. The issue of uh, Chebet, of course, winning two gold medals, 5,000 5, meters and 10,000, has never been actually done in the whole of the country. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to congratulate them on, for that performance. On the other issue, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my second home, Greece, which gave the world Olympics. Everybody knows Olympics started in Greece. And I would like to take this opportunity to appreciate them for giving the world these Olympics. The other issue, Mr. Speaker, we noted, uh, Kenya participated only in athletics. And all the mentors, 11 of them, are coming from athletics and disciplines. We need to widen our, sport, uh, our sports uh, coverage, Mr. Speaker, in terms of uh, the participation. We need to increase more games so that we can earn more mentors. Of course, we are much top in Africa, but we still need to do a lot to, so that we can actually start competing with countries like the United States, who banked over 100 medals, and compete with even countries like China. Mr. Speaker, I can say we don't have time actually to talk, but let me take this opportunity on behalf of my family and people of Mwingi West to say congratulations to Kenyans for bringing us this victory. 11 Chematia. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I also want to take the opportunity to congratulate our beloved athletes and 
those uh, other uh, athletes or uh, other disciplines that participated in the Olympics. Mr. Speaker, as members of, uh, have also raised that there's a lot of concern about the performance of this year's team. Uh, ordinarily, we, Kenya always participates in most of the disciplines in the athletics, specifically almost all of them. And we, we even uh, have the opportunity to have uh, 100 meters, the Omanyala, Mr. Omanyala, who did very well, as much as he did not uh, get a medal. But, Mr. Speaker, there's one thing I'm also noticing that is coming out very clear, that the branding in Kenya today is no longer the way we used to uh, take our athletes in a very high regard. I was expecting the news, the televisions, should be giving a lot of gov coverage on Faith Kipiego, for instance, in the exemplary performance that he has given this country. And taking actually to the extent of um, winning the gold medal and going, I mean, uh, breaking a whole world record. If you, can, if you look at that, uh, the world news in the athletics world gave uh, Faith Kipiego um, a qualification of Usain Bolt. And that means Kenya is so much blessed. And that way we need to celebrate her so much. We should be even giving her a lot of incentives. We should, as, as a government of the day, probably should be even rewarding her and many of them that have participated. And that way we will in intensify and incentivize most of the athletes. The Honorable uh, Pukose. Robert. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for allowing me to congratulate our athletes. Honorable Speaker, I want to congratulate uh, Faith Kibiagon together with uh, Chebet and uh, of utmost the, my constituent, Ronald Kwemoy, who managed to get silver in the 5,000. Also, my neighbor. Uh, Bernard, uh, my neighbor Wanyonyi from Saboti, who also managed to get gold in the 800 meters. You know, Mount Elgon is the origin of the champions. So, and you can see even on the Ugandan side, we had Cheptegei getting gold in the 10,000 meters. So, I want to also congratulate my neighbor, and Cheptegei happens to be also my uncle. So, I think. He did well for Ugandans, and that is good. And you know, myself and Honorable Undo here, we come from the border, so we have relatives on either side. I think that is very commendable. On the flip side of it, Honorable Speaker, is that in the next, uh, in the next Olympics, the work for CS Kipchumba Murkomen is cut out because he must be able to widen the scope and I saw comments which he made that he has noted that issue, and we hope that he will be able to act under the new dispensation to make sure that we present athletes in almost all games. We should have athletes in... Uh, and you know, my, our neighbors, the Turkanas, the Pokots, they are very good in spear throwing. So we should have next, in the next uh, champions, we should have spears those who are throwing spears, short boot, uh, other games. Even uh, the Honorable Wanjiku Muya. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I first uh, start to congratulate the Office of the Speaker for giving the House this moment to celebrate our athletes. Thank you very much. Honorable Speaker, I congratulate Honorable Faith and the team even our own Kipchoge, even if it was difficult. And Honorable Speaker, I want to put the record straight to say that shortly after the Paralympic Games will start on 28th. Just to correct my brother, Honorable KJ, is not Special Olympic, it is Paralympic. Paralympic is for physically disabled athletes. Special Olympic is for intellectual disabled. And uh, Deaf Olympia is for the Deaf category. Honorable Speaker, we want to tell the KBC to buy enough rights to show 
the athletes of Paralympic with equal measure, just like they did for the others. To Honorable Murkomen, this is your first assignment. We want you to show, just like you stood with the others, we do not want to repeat the Ababunamwamba scenario of last year, where he was not able to support the Special Olympic. Support the Paralympic athletes, be with them, let KBC show the Kenyans the talents that we have in those other categories. To all our athletes, thank you and congratulations. Thank you, the Honorable Dr. Phyllis Bato. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. I would want to join my colleagues and on behalf of my people of Moibin to congratulate our athletes for their sterling performance in Paris. They were number seven, they took us to be position 17 in the world and to be the top in Africa. That is not a mean achievement. Mr. Speaker, particularly I want to congratulate Beatrice Chebet and Wanyonyi for the medals. And uh, I also want to say that it was good that uh, the, the, the decision to deny uh, Faith Kibiagon uh, the, the bronze was rescinded. Otherwise, we would have gone to occupy Ethiopia because she had been pushed away by an Ethiopian. Mr. Speaker, every gold uh, they received or every medal they received uh, sparked a lot of excitement. They kept us glued on our TVs for 19 good days and we were very excited and every opportunity gave us a chance to, to, to see what was happening in Paris. And uh, we hope that the coming, uh, the coming activities, the, the special, the, 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 what we, my colleagues were uh, referring us to a Special Olympics, we will do much we will do much better. And to Murkomen, we wish him the best in this new assignment of taking over the sports docket. And we know he will do a commendable job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Francis Gay. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I also want to join my colleagues in thanking and congratulating our, our athletes who, who really gave us a very good name. We, are, we were very proud to see our athletes excelling in, uh, in Paris. Um, I want especially to mention Faith Kibiagon and Chebet, who did a very sterling uh, performance and uh, our people were clued to the TV. Myself, I watched throughout, and I saw our athletes were doing extremely well. Mr. Speaker, I think it's high time. I know we can do better than this. This I know. And I, I think we need to prepare our athletes better than we, are, we, we did last time. And I want to thank Honorable Mulkomen for making a very strong statement in Paris, because he said we, it is time we diversify, that we can do better in other, other games um, uh, which, which are available, because we cannot continue. You remember now, uh, Mr. Speaker, the 10,000 meters, which we have always been doing, and the steeplechase is now gone to other people. So it's high time we change, we diversify, so that we can be able to, to have more medals in, this, in these areas. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank 